So hello and welcome to the model walkthrough series. Um, this is our first session in a series of four and what we are going to be covering are a number of models which the National Demand Capacity Team have been recently developing or have developed and would like to share with you and show you how they may be able to support you in service planning and any demand capacity exercise that you will be doing over there. So as I mentioned, today we're going to be starting with the emergency department model. So let me tell you a little bit more about that. So today you've got myself, Ash Mahanti from the Demand and Capacity Team, and we've also got Imogen Head from the Clinical Workforce Productivity Team. And we're going to be talking about the background of the model and what the model can do and how it can be used and some of the capabilities of it. So I'm going to be covering that and Imogen's going to be talking about how this can be applied in the real world to support service planning in your organisation. So a little bit of background to the model walkthrough series. So I've already given you a um, brief context about what this was, but we were going to be showcasing um, four new models which we have developed and how these can be used to support operational service planning. Now, we're not going to be talking about the fundamentals or the principles underpinning demand capacity planning, um, but you can learn more about these um, if you visit our website. So we've got a number of resources around that, and also we've got a number of additional tools and support offers which you can actually look at over there. So just to clarify, um, the four models which I'm going to be referring to um, about this series um, you'll learn more about that but we do have additional offers and um, tools and support available out there so if you'd like to know more about that and any of the fundamental principles please go and have a look at the website. So a little bit about the walkthrough series um, it's a collaboration between the demand and capacity team the Clinical Workforce Productivity Team and the Emergency Care Improvement Support Team. And again, um, this is the emergency department model um, that we're covering today. In the next week, um, we're going to be um, looking at the community and mental health demand and capacity offer that we have for those services. And also walking through what is known as the Discharge Hub Staffing Model. The week following that, we're going to be talking about the Urgent Response Model which is the um, second offer that we have for urgent and emergency care, the ED model being the first. And in our final week, we're going to be talking about the caseload model. So this is more suited to community and mental health services where um, patients may require um, longer, we have longer term conditions which require ongoing care and may be on a caseload. So that's what that refers to. So, let me tell you a little bit more about the UEC side of things. So we've developed two models to help providers operationally plan their urgency emergency care capacity. So the emergency department model will tell you if you have the right capacity to ensure patients are seen by a clinical decision maker within an hour of arrival. Now that refers to the step after a patient arrives in the department, whether it's a walk in attendance, whether they're conveyed. And it's the step after triage where basically it's this when it is determined that the patient no longer requires any ongoing care in the department. So that would be what the clinical decision informs. And really that then informs of the next step, so whether that patient is referred or discharged. So this is very much looking at the front end of the ED pathway. And I think it's also important to acknowledge that there are a number of aspects around ED performance and it's not just the front end, but anecdotal conversations would suggest that if your patients have that clinical decision within an hour for arrival and you don't have issues with flow and you don't have issues with beds, you will hit the four hour target or, or, or whatever target that you are working towards. 
the model itself isn't focused on the target. It's more focused on what is good for the patients. And this, and the 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 aspiration to see patients and have that decision made with an alpha arrival again is in law and with our chem guidelines around this. So I just wanted to be crystal clear on what the model is actually going to be focusing on. And um, very quickly, the urgent response model. So it works in a similar fashion to the ED model, um, but is is aimed at services which are um, so community services or community mental health services or mental health services which go and see patients in the, and deliver those treatments in the community. Now, this model will let you know if you have the right capacity in the right place to ensure requests are responded to within locally agreed timescales. Again, we're not talking about any specific targets here. We would actually empower you to actually decide what those are um, depending on um, agreements locally or those which are best practice. How this differs from the ED model is it allows you to factor in travel time and it also allows you to consider any follow up um, contacts or ongoing care in the short term. And um, you can learn more about that in week three. So. Here are a few things which you need to take into consideration when modelling your demand capacity for emergency departments. On the demand side of things, um, demand is variable, but it's predictable to quite a, quite a high degree. So the demand of on your department would vary by the day of the week, potentially, time of day and seasonal variations. We know that following the weekend and the um, time leading up to the weekend can potentially be more um, busy. Um, so time of the day, again, generally speaking, you see you can see a peak maybe around or just after lunchtime. And then again in the evening after working hours or thereabouts. So that sort of late afternoon, early evening time. We also have seasonal variations. So, for example, winter pressures, an example of how that plays into effect. The, the profile, the demand profile for your department can vary in a number of ways. But again, um, I'll tell you a little bit about how the model can take some of these into consideration and actually predict what that will be. On the capacity side of things or the ability to see your patients, now this can be affected by a um, number of components. So in the schedule side of things, um, the available staff, so who's on your rotor? What is the skill mix of those staff? Who do you actually have on there? Um, the, the types of decision makers. On the non-scheduling side of things, um, things such as external pressures, so cubicle or floor space. Um, if you've got a if you've got a lack of that on a particular given day, that can be a potential bottleneck. Again, this is the same with discharge delays. And again, redeployment, for example, during COVID, if you've got decision makers who are also um, performing other tasks, potentially outside of the department, and are not available for decision making for the time that they normally would be, that's also a consideration, but we can take that into account in the model. And again, as I mentioned, flow and bed availability. These are things which you need to be considered and can have an impact as well. So let me give you a very brief overview of what the model actually does. So we forecast your future demand. We compare this with the available capacity. And we highlight and quantify any gaps which may exist. I want to at this point um, just um, make a comment that around the model side of things today, I'm going to be giving you an overview of what the model can do and the principles behind it and how this can be put into practice. And then Imogen's going to be talking about a real world example. 
I'm not going to be actually walking through how to populate the model. And the reason for that is we've already got a session on that. It's it's uh, we've got a recorded tutorial which is available on our website. So if you want to have a look at that afterwards, um, we will have a link so where you can access this model and um, look at the tutorials that we have around the actual populating of the model. So let's talk about the requirements. So first of all, who do you need to involve? So to ensure um, this process is as robust as it can be, you should involve a number of types of individuals, and this needs to be a collaborative exercise. You should involve operational managers or operational lead. You need to have clinical involvement, and you may also require support from your information or BI team. It's important to um, note that this model should be operationally owned and it requires clinical input. Now, the operational staff, your clinicians, information beyond, this is not an exhaustive list. I would say this is the minimum. In addition to that, you may have service improvement leads, you may have project managers, you may have other critical friends who may be useful to facilitate this process, but it's important to state that there needs to be a collaborative exercise. On the data side of things, so for your demand, we need historic data, um, ideally between one and three years, stratified by the stream urgency or dependency of your patients and the day of week and hour of day. This is data which is routinely held and readily available because this is actually the same data that ED reps require. On the capacity side of things, we require shift patterns. So when your shifts are running from and to, and also information from rotors. In effect, um, this is information which is already held in your rotors or rosters, whether it's a knee roster, whether it's something on an Excel spreadsheet or any other means. And we also need um, information around how this decision making is impacted by the decision maker role. And again, that's where that clinical discussion comes into play. So on the subject of the capacity side of things, let me tell you a little bit more about what we do in the model. I've already talked a little bit about the shifts, but I want to, to actually illustrate how that actually um, works in the model. So in the model, um, you will have your shift patterns for your department and you can configure that over here. So you can put your shift name and you need to configure when that shift runs from and when it finishes and include any breaks um, that are also stipulated. So this would be time where um, there, there are no, um, basically there's no decision making capacity for a particular type of shift. Now, um, once this information is configured, um, this is just a graphical um, depiction in the model, uh, just showing that, um, illustrating the um, configuration that you've put there so you can actually at a glance look at what's going on. Once you've entered your shift patterns, you enter your information from your rotors. Now, this may look like a um, quite a busy table in the model, but um, let me walk you through what's going on over here. We have your role type over here, which may refer to um, the top. Well, it refers to your decision maker, but it may refer to things such as a senior doctor, a consultant, a nurse practitioner, or it may refer to um, some of the stratifications used in the workforce matrix, which Imogen will be talking about a little bit later on. Um, we can also put individual role names, um, so your decision maker, their actual names or any other designation which you'd like to apply. And you can also stipulate whether they are a core member of staff or whether they are locum, ad hoc or bank or plus cost or whatever other label that you want to put on um, a staff member who is not a permanent dedicated member of staff. And over here, in this instance, we have for the next week and um, by day, what we have basically done is for each decision maker on the router, we have configured what shift that they are working on for any particular day. Um, so this side of things is actually compatible with the workforce team's establishment setting tool. And again, Imogen will be um, saying a few words about that later on. Now, I mentioned we need to know how long it takes to make that clinical decision 
by a um, decision maker role. So we need to have those conversations, but ultimately we need to understand how long does it take to see a patient? How long does it take to make that decision for a patient? And this will vary by stream, by urgency, by dependency or any other stratification that you want to apply to your patients. This will also potentially vary by the type of decision maker. For example, you may have a senior doctor who takes half an hour to make a dis clinical decision for a particular patient. You may have a consultant and for the same patient, it actually takes them longer, not 30 minutes, but 40 to make that decision. This is because in addition to making um, in, in addition to the decision making duties of that consultant, they will have other responsibilities, for example, supervising the department administration, so on and so forth, which may mean that they aren't able to make decisions as quickly as a senior doctor. What I am saying is. The the time it takes a particular decision maker role to make a decision for a given patient is not direct, may not be directly related to their seniority or grade. And it's important to acknowledge that. What I am saying is that there's very and we need to understand how. Once we have done this, we combine that with the information which is held in rotors and rosters, as I um, described um, in slides previously, and we can actually build a picture of what your capacity looks like for your department for um, the next week. Over here, it's been configured as a um, relatively straightforward recess majors and margins configuration. And we can actually see how the um, capacity is split across the different streams in this case. I need to mention that this is not um, a restrictive way of doing it. Um, over here, we've used these three streams. The model will allow you to configure up to 10 streams, urgencies, dependencies, streams, or any other certification you want to apply. Um, however, however works for your department, and you can put up to 10 of those in the model. Now let's talk about um, forecasting future demand. Now, I've mentioned that the model requires ideally between a year and three years worth of historic data. It can work on less, but we, we suggest you use um, at least a year. Now, we enter this data into the model, um, which is built in Excel, but we've created a web app which actually does some more advanced analytical heavy lifting. And let me tell you a little bit more about that. Instead of just looking at historic demand to inform you know, this is what this is what our historic demand was, and we're going to base our future behavior of our department on that. And um, we're not doing naive forecasting. We're not looking at retrospective data and assuming that that is what's going to happen moving forward. The 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 analytical um, methods that we are using over here looks at that historic demand, does some forecasting with this, um, does some quite um, advanced forecasting with this actually, and is able to take into account things such as seasonality, um, events such as bank holidays, variability by day of week, variability by hour of day, and, and, and a lot more actually. And it applies all of this and actually produces quite a robust forecast of what your behaviour may look like moving forward. And again, I need to stress, um, we're predicting what will happen in the next coming weeks. We're not saying it's going to behave the same as it did before. And really, it's um, this is what we're actually this is what we were actually um, saying is what the web app is going to be used for. And I'm not going to go too much into technical details about this, but um, if you'd like to learn more about the actual analytical techniques, um, do do get in touch with us afterwards and we can tell you more about that. So, um, but let's move on from here. We have we have configured the um, capacity for your department. We've we've forecasted the future demand. Now, what do we do? We can also account for external factors. 
So we've talked about some of the um, considerations for your for your department in terms of factors which may affect your demand, factors which may affect you the available the ability to see your patients um, in in the summary slide earlier. So the the forecasting will do a lot of stuff based on things such as seasonality, day of week, time of day, so on and so forth. But what about factors which aren't picked up like this? So we can account for things in um, in the model by, by, by this mechanism. So we may know that anecdotally on a hot day, we can expect to see in this case a 20% uplift in attendances. And this will affect all streams, for example. If we know, if we have the weather forecast and we know we're going to have a really hot day, um, we can actually we can actually um, cater for this in the model, specifying when um, this event is likely to take place and what impact we are expecting this to have. And so it can take that into consideration. In addition to this, there may be certain effects which um, have an effect on the ability to make that clinical decision or the time taken to do so. For example, if you have um, discharge delays, um, we may know that um, your decision makers are having to um, deal deal with that, which may take time away from making those decisions. And again, we can actually specify that, OK, we know we've, we're potentially going to have an issue on this day. We know roughly what impact this will have and we can cater for that. Again, you could apply this to a shortage in cubicle space or floor space and we basically anything which may impact your your demand or your ability to see your patients we're leaving this open and configurable so you can account for these again you may have certain um external factors which um means that the capacity that you have to see your patients is reduced so in this case i'm i'm i'm, I'm using an example um of covid19 pressures Due to social distancing and the pandemic and people being redeployed, basically we have a 50% reduction in the available decision making capacity. If we know this, we can apply this in the model and um, account for that. So we've forecasted future demand, we have configured the capacity, we have accounted for external factors. Let's now look at the outputs of the model. The first output of the model is a heat map and at a glance this shows the situation of your entire department for the um, for the next week in this case and at a glance it allows you to actually see what's going on in terms of where there may or may not be a mismatch in um, required capacity and available capacity. If it's green you have enough capacity at a given time on a given day. If it's red, there's a mismatch. And the intensity of that red um, is talking about um, the degree of that mismatch. So the more red it is, the more there's a mismatch. And you can perhaps look into that. In addition to the heat map, we have um, we have some charts where we can actually display the same information in a slightly different way. So over here, we're looking at the whole department, the available versus required capacity for the next week in this case, by hour of day and day of week. We can also drill down to individual streams, dependencies or urgencies and look at what's going on over there. So over here, we're looking at the same information for the next week by hour of day, but we're looking at this just for majors. And in the example that I used here, we can also do this for minors and recess as well. And finally, if you just want to drill down on a single day to maybe fine tune or see what's going on over there, we can do that too. So we're looking at majors for the whole week over here. Now we're looking at majors for just Sunday in this case by hour of day. So it just allows you to um, have different levels of granularity depending on what you want to look at and how you want to visualise that information. 
Now, the final output of the model is um, the Q builder. So what this does is based on the um, forecasted demand and based on the capacity information that we have entered, it is able to actually predict at any given time, in this case for the next week, by hour of day, how many patients are going to be waiting in your department who have not had that clinical decision made at any given point. And this may be useful, for example, highlighting when you may have days queues or peak building, but also you may know um, in if, if you're operationally or clinically managing your department, you may know that there is a certain point which becomes a tipping point where things start to go awry. And if you know what this is and, and you compare that against the queue builder, it may enable you to mitigate for this in advance or potentially highlight on a particular day at a particular time, you may need to implement any escalation measures that you have in place or procedures. So that's all I want to talk about um, in terms of the model and how it can be used, what it can do, how it's configured and what the outputs are, of the model are. And I would now like to hand over to Imogen, who's going to talk about some of the practica practical application and how this can be used in the real world. So Imogen, over to you. Thanks, Ash. So I'm Imogen. I'm part of the Clinical Workforce Productivity Team, and we specialise in e-rostering and e-job planning, supporting trust to implement um, software or where they have software, making sure they're getting best use out of that software. The other aspect of our, 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 our work is developing workforce deployment tools to support evidence-based workforce deployments, such as using the Safer Care Nursing Tool or developing other types of workforce tools which help you um, ensure that you've got the right staff doing the right things at the right time. In terms of um, how how this tool has been used in practice, when we were testing it with a number of different trusts, um, we we did a case study, and I'm just going to talk through kind of the principles of this case study. So, essentially. Um, King's College Hospital uh, knew that they had a challenge with their junior doctor rotors. They they knew that they were non-compliant with the new junior doctor work, uh, time directives. So the general manager uh, worked with the rotor coordinator and clinical lead to think about ways that they could deliver a different type of rotor that would meet the new contractual requirements. Essentially, the, the junior doctors were working every other weekend and they knew they needed to move the, the week, uh, the, the working patterns from every other weekend to one in three weekends. So they knew what the, the new rotor should look like. What they didn't know was the impact it was going to have on the service. So what, whether it would change the ability, um, change their ability to meet the service needs. So what they did is they loaded, uh, they, they loaded all of the historic information into the into the model as Ash has described, and then they had they loaded in the existing rotor, the one they knew they needed to change, and looked where the capacity and demand kind of aligned. And it didn't align 100%, but they mostly managed to meet their their capacity and demand. Then what they did is they modelled their new roster that they wanted to implement and looked at the impact it would have on their capacity and demand. And what it showed was that um, there was a mismatch between the capacity and demand on specific points in the across the week. So particularly at the weekend and then to twilight shifts Monday and Tuesday. They then reworked that roster, putting in some additional posts to um, demonstrate how the additional posts would then realign the activity with the demand. And they took that paper to to the board in order to get sign off for additional funding. They they got additional funding agreed for one year um, and have been able to recruit to those posts. So I think it's just really helpful. Um, this model has been really helpful in that it's provide the evidence base that they needed to take to the board to demonstrate that they're, with the change in roster, they'd need additional investment. It's something they could have worked out and they and they knew some of the differences just from looking at the rotor changes, but it was really helpful to have that evidence base and to use the charts that they had um, to, to, to show kind of the, the board what the, the key issues were. So that that's just a, a small kind of case study on how this has been been used. The other thing I just wanted to talk about a little bit was um, the establishment setting and workforce matrix. So the establishment setting tool is essentially a tool that helps uh, helps you 
um, build your establishment. So you take uh, the, the data that Ash just described in the uh, capacity and demand model and you pull it through into this tool and what it shows you is based on your uh, activity data and then based on your whole time equivalents. So you put in your current shift patterns um, that you have within your workforce. Uh, and what it shows you is with annual leave, study leave, sickness, parental leave, all the various um, leave allocations that you need to think about, actually the number of people that you're going to have working on a day to day basis. So it, it kind of it gives you um, a bit like sort of more clarity on the numbers of people and you can play around so you can say also oh, I need I've got 10 of this type of individual but actually what that's showing me is I'm three shift shorts every day so if I increase that to 11 what does it look like um and the really good thing about the, the tool uh, is that it um it takes into account all the different contractual stipulations that exist for consultants, doctors in training, AFC, uh, trust grade, etc. So uh, the tool is in development. We're hoping to have it um, tested a bit more rigorously over the next few months and then to publish. But that's just a sort of insight into what it can do. And then the other tool I just wanted to talk about was the workforce matrix, which is essentially moving from profession based uh, rostering approach approaches to competency and capability based approaches so using skills to roster your department as opposed to I'm a doctor I work over here and I'm an ACP and I work over there and never the twain will meet so this it's really just a framework in which uh, you can think about the skills you need the skills the individuals have within the department. So this is very much an individual conversation. So Ash, for example, has X skill. I have, ex uh, for example, Y skill. You know, where would I sit? What could we offer? And then using those skills grouped together to do some skills based rostering and aligning that to the patient need. So that, that this is currently in uh, pilot and um, we're hoping to get the results in the next couple of months but so far the interim evaluations have been really positive and um it's had positive feedback so we're we we think that um, it will be well received uh, and if you wanted to know any more about that you're welcome to contact me or the um central inbox which i think comes at the end of the presentation i didn't have too much more to say ash i'm going to hand back over to you perfect thank you very much for that emission and again, it's um, we're really glad that this is actually um, the, the series of model demonstrations that we're doing. We're really glad that this is actually a collaboration. So it's it's nice to actually talk about so the demand capacity side of things. So what what our motto is to plan for patients to ensure that they um, don't wait longer than necessary for treatment. And um, yeah, the offers that we we talked about in the demand capacity team, we like to think that. We, we provide tools, training and resources, but it's it's a bit more than that. We like to um, empower organisations to have that capability to actually do that um, for themselves. And I think on its own, it's not as strong as it is when collaborating with, um, so when collaborating with, for example, the clinical workforce team and also the improvement support teams, which we will be, you'll be seeing more about um, their work in the coming sessions. It's actually really nice to actually talk about how we can actually work together to actually support this. And um, that's something that um, is, is really good. Um, so, um, Imogen, thank you very much for that. I'd like to very quickly just summarise um, so the, the ED model and tell you a little bit more why you can access it. So, it predicts the required capacity for your department, which will support um, will support um, you building your rotors and what is required. Um, it, it compares this against the available capacity from your rotor and it highlights and quantifies any differences in required and available um, capacity. It also estimates the key source for decision makers in the department. Um, now, um, in the slide over here, you may be able to see two um, or thumbnails for some videos. Um, the tutorial, um, so the actual population going through the model in Excel and filling um, bits in and going through the forecasting and all of that side of things. Um, you can go through the actual walkthrough um, in the video on the right and the video on the left um, 
And that is just an animation talking about some of the basic principles which underpin demanding capacity planning in EDs. The model, these two tutorials, they're available um, on our website, so the link is over there. We're also very happy to um, for you to contact us with any queries that you have, and we're happy to have an individual discussion with you. Um, so do let us know um, if, if that is something that we'd like to explore. Um, a little bit more about the series. So um, I mentioned at the start of the, the presentation that we're running um, three more sessions. So um, so this is week one. Um, the offers over weeks two, three and four are just on this slide at the moment. Um, you're able to find out more information and register for those sessions using the link um, at the bottom of that slide. And again, this slide deck you should be able to download as well on Futures NHS. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a moment. So I'd like to finally thank you for your time in viewing this um, recording today. To find out more about um, the uh, Workforce Productivity um, team and Imogen's work, you can you can uh, join their uh, Futures NHS collaboration platform. Um, a link to that is over there and is in the slide deck. And you can also email them at the email address, which is on screen. Um, to, um, if you want to stay connected um, with the demand capacity team and learn more about um, the offers that we have, um, in addition to um, the four models, we've, we've got a number of other models which are also available to download and support service planning in other areas. Visit us on our website, um, link is over there. If you want to be kept in the loop around any developments in the demand capacity world, you can sign up to our bulletin. Um, so we've got a newsletter, so um, we can we can keep you in the loop in regards to what's going on. You can also um, join us on Futures NHS, and um, our platform over there has a number of additional su uh, support offers, including um, recordings and sessions, um, which were so the sessions which we're going to be covering in the next few weeks are going to be on there. Um, sessions which we have covered in the past and some case studies are also available on there, so do check that out. Um, finally, we are on Twitter. Um, our hashtag is Plan for Patients, and you can follow myself, um, Mahanti Ash. You can also follow Matthew O'Reilly, who will be leading on sessions two and four. So um, thank you again for your time, and um, please do get in touch with us if you've got any further queries. Thank you very much.